Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Pasco eSchool's Great American Teach-In for 2015. Today we have joining us uh, Mr. Rob Cavallaro. He earned degrees in forestry and wildlife management from Virginia Tech and has worked as a wildlife biologist for over 20 years in the Mountain West. He currently works as a regional wildlife biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, and his duties are to coordinate conservation and management of at-risk wildlife species in the Upper Snake region of Idaho. In this session, he will talk about the Yellowstone National Park ecosystem and the conservation of at-risk animals. If you'd like to ask Mr. Cavallaro a question during today's session, please text your name and your question to 813-501-2204. You can see that number is under my name here on the screen. Again, that's 813-501-2204. Thanks for joining us today, Mr. Cavallaro. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, um, I prepared a slide. A slide. I prepared a slide, a slide for my talk, so I'm going to go ahead and set that up if that's okay. That sounds great. And here we go. And so let's get started. I think I've got a slide presentation that's going to last about a half an hour. And uh, I'm willing to take questions during that time or afterwards, whichever whichever works best. Sounds good. Uh, so as Mrs. Lotke said, I'm uh, Rob Cavallaro. Uh, I work for the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. And the mission of Idaho Department of Fish and Game, our mission is to preserve, protect, perpetuate, and manage Idaho's wildlife. And my specific role within the department is regional wildlife biologist in within the Upper Snake region of, of Idaho. And even more specific than that, I am in the Wildlife Diversity Program, and our role within the Department of Fish and Game is to preserve, protect, perpetuate, and manage Idaho's species of greatest conservation need, which are those species that are considered at risk. <clears throat> First question you might ask is, where, where the heck is Idaho again? And uh, I thought I'd just start off with this. Uh, that's us in the red there, up in the Mountain West. and. We're about 2,600 miles from Florida on average. So if you were going to jump in your car and, and drive out to visit us, it would take you about 40 hours. So uh, a good, uh, kind of a good haul from Florida. Um, also, uh, just a little thumbnail on, on Idaho uh, as it compares to Florida. Um, we're about twice the size of Florida. I think Florida is around 37 million acres. And the population of Florida is about 20 million people. The population of Idaho is 1.6 million people. So a much lower population density uh, in Idaho. The upper snake region of Idaho is in the eastern part of the state, up against the Wyoming border, and, uh, and importantly, up against Yellowstone National Park, which is that area in the green. Uh, we also, uh, to our northern border, is uh, the state of Montana. As the name would imply, uh, the Upper Snake region, a, a prominent feature is the Snake River, which emanates from Yellowstone National Park, goes through Wyoming, and then down through eastern and then southern Idaho. When I think about the Upper Snake region of Idaho, and when I think about what I would want to communicate to folks uh, first, it would be the beautiful landscapes that we have. And uh, we have the highest mountains in the state of Idaho. This is the, in the upper left. That's the Lost River Range, um, which rise to above 12,000 feet above sea level. Um, and so it's a very mountainous area. It's an area that has you know, a lot of beautiful wild rivers, like the Henry's Fork River, uh, which flows through a portion of our region. The Henry's Fork has its origins from snowfall in Yellowstone National Park and snow melt from the park uh, feeds this river. And then down in the lowlands uh, of our region, you know, down out of the, in the lower elevations, we have uh, a, do a dominant landscape is sagebrush steppe desert. So these are dry, drier, you know, starker areas, but also still very beautiful and very important for wildlife. Economic drivers in our region, important economic drivers are agriculture. Uh, we grow a lot of potatoes in the low elevations of our region, also small grains like wheat and barley. Uh, cattle ranching, very important economic driver. 
Uh, employment related to federal government is important, as is outdoor recreation with all that beautiful scenery and wild country uh, recreationists come from around the world to enjoy this area. And then a neat part of uh, being in the Upper Snake region is also being part of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. The Greater uh, depicted in this map here, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem in Corp is encompassed in three different states, uh, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. At the core is Yellowstone National Park and surrounding the park are six national forests. There's other public lands, three national wildlife refuges. Uh, one estimate of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is about 22 million acres of highly protected lands. And, and if you remember, you know, the state of Florida is 37 million acres. So this is, this is a region that is roughly two thirds the size of the state of Florida. So uh, a big, big area. Um, some ecologists consider this, uh, the Greater Yellowstone area, the largest intact northern temperate ecosystem left on earth. So um, a pretty special place for those of us who live out here and, and those who visit here. Uh, symbols of Yellowstone's intactness or Greater Yellowstone's intactness are uh, some of the wildlife populations and some of the, the functions that we maintain that are rare in other parts of the world. And one species that for which we have a, a viable population and which is an icon of the Greater Yellowstone area is grizzly bears. Uh, there are about 700 to 1,000 grizzly bears, which is a, which is a very robust population at capacity. And the fact that we can, you know, maintain uh, a, a robust population of grizzly bears indicates is indicative of uh, the quality of the habitat and also the relatively low human population density. Another function that we maintain in the Greater Yellowstone area that is highly threatened in, in, in a lot of other parts of the world is large animal migrations over long distances. We have uh, large populations of elk, moose, and deer, and those animals are still able to complete long distance migrations from their high elevation summer ranges where they have calves and, and uh, fawns. And then as the winter progresses, they can move down into those lower elevations. And th the fact that they can still get across these landscapes without barriers uh, is an important function of the Greater Yellowstone. And I'll point out my, my location right now on this map is you, if you can see on the lower left, is Idaho Falls, uh, let me get rid of that, is Idaho Falls, that's where I'm sitting right now in my office, um, just outside of this, you know, some of the colored map areas. So another uh, important facet of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is the amount of at-risk and the amount and quality of at-risk species, wildlife species population that still persist. And these are wildlife species that in, in a lot of other parts of the country haven't done so well, but are doing pretty well in our part of the country. And these are species like, uh, starting from the left and then moving clockwise, is uh, the pygmy rabbit, which lives down in the sagebrush steppe habitat. And it's had uh, difficulty in other parts of the country, uh, including some states where it no longer exists, but doing pretty well in our region. Uh, Wolverine, which lives up in the high country in the snowy uh, mountains, uh, good population of wolverine in the Greater Yellowstone area. Peregrine falcon, a species that was formerly threatened under the Endangered Species Act and is now recovered nationwide. We have strong breeding population of peregrines. Um, Yellowstone cutthroat trout, that's the native trout of the Greater Yellowstone area. You know, an interesting aspect, uh, you know, from an aquatic standpoint of the Greater Yellowstone area is we are uh, the headwaters of the country. So, the Missouri River, which flows into the Mississippi River and then out to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, out by you, is, um, has its beginnings right here in the Yellowstone area. The Colorado River, which flows into the Gulf of California in Mexico, also has its origins in um, the Greater Yellowstone area. And then the Snake River, as we've already talked about, flows into the Columbia and the Pacific, has its origins right here. And so, when you're at the headwaters, uh, you know, sort of upstream from everybody, you often have a lot of high quality aquatic habitat, which we do. And that high quality aqu aquatic habitat and fish, uh, fish population support uh, a big bald eagle population, like this young guy in his nest here um, in the Greater Yellowstone area. We have over 90 bald eagle breeding territories in our part of Idaho, which is 
a very strong population. Um, amphibians, which have declined uh, worldwide, um, including in, in Idaho, uh, despite that we maintain some strong at-risk uh, amphibian populations like this northern leopard frog, and then harlequin duck, um, a, a relatively rare mountain duck breeder which persists pretty well here in the Great Yellowstone. So grizzly bears, large animal migrations, lots of rare species, kind of a cool area all the way around. And so with that background, I thought I'd jump into a little bit about my job. And I thought that the best way to describe to you about uh, the, the type of work I do is to give a project overview. And I've chosen three projects to describe. One is sort of a general uh, conservation and management program we have for grizzly bears in our region. Uh, another one is a trumpeter swan restoration project in a, one valley in our region. And then I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit of a wolverine research study that we have going on that we're a participant in. So with that, I will start with grizzly bear conservation and management. This is a, this is a photograph of a grizzly taken in the greater Yellowstone area with a trail camera. And you can see he looks pretty surprised. And it sounds like, looks like he heard the click and turned to look at the camera. And so if you're walking around out at night uh, with your headlamp in this area, this is just the image you don't want to see in your headlamp. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about the history of grizzly bear, so that you can have some context of why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, on the left is a historic range map of grizzly bears, and you could see at one point prior to European um, uh, occupancy of the West, uh, grizzly bears were pretty widespread from you know from the Great Plains to the Pacific Ocean and then down into Mexico. And early on with the first explorers, European explorers in the West who were uh, Lewis and Clark and then the mountain men, uh, it was clear that this grizzly bear was a pretty, pretty tough customer. And in fact, when Lewis and Clark, who, who were part of the first sp government sponsored expedition into the West, uh, were talking to some of the Great Plains Indians that they ran into, the Indians told them that you're going to run into this bear west of here and it's, it's uh, a serious uh, customer and you need to pay attention and be careful. And at first, Lewis and Clark disregarded that advice. Uh, they, they thought they were experienced woodsmen and, and they knew about bears and this wasn't going to be a problem. Well, they quickly changed their mind on that uh, once they encountered the bear and realized just how uh, tough it was, how formidable and really unafraid of humans it was, which is very different from the bears that they had encountered in the East. And this uh, sort of truculent relationship continued <laughs> with the mountain men that came after Lewis and Clark. And then after the, the age of the mountain men came the settlers. And these were folks uh, from the east who wanted to start uh, a, a new life in the west. And they were farmers and ranchers. They were business people who wanted to grow towns and build a new life. And, you know, these endeavors... Uh, which are an important part of our history of the country, were in direct conflict with grizzly bears. And so as a result of that conflict, grizzly bears were eradicated through a lot of the West. And one of the places that, you know, there were a few populations that maintained in the lower 48, and these areas tend to be where there was a lot of wild country left. And one of those areas is the Greater Yellowstone area, which we've been talking about. And so, you know, in 1970, the grizzly bear in the lower 48 states was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And at that time, there was a partnership among agencies and organizations to try to conserve uh, grizzly bears in this greater Yellowstone area, which had a lot of good habitat left and a low human population density. And that those efforts have been very successful. Uh, the grizzly bear population in the greater Yellowstone is, is recovered and probably at capacity now. And so our future conservation efforts for grizzly bear uh, include two things. One is gonna be monitoring the population to ensure that all the work that went into recovery uh, stays in place and we maintain those, those conservation successes. And the other thing is main, uh, minimizing conflicts with human beings. This is the greatest threat to uh, grizzly bears, you know, uh, is you know they're they're an animal that 
uh, has to eat constantly, especially in the fall. And, you know, humans are often a, a potential food source. And when they get together over food, that, that is a conflict and uh, something to be avoided. The other, th the other uh, potential threat for conflict is recreation. Uh, this is a big area for outdoor recreation, for hiking, camping, hunting, and fishing. And when you're a recreationist going out in the woods, um, you know, you want to, you know, manage um, the likelihood of running into a grizzly bear and be prepared if you run into a grizzly bear. So these are what our, our managements are going to encompass in the, in the future. And as far as population monitoring, how do we do that? Well, it's a, it's a very complex, uh, you know, protocol for monitoring, but it involves a big part of it is capturing and radio collaring grizzly bears. And by radio collaring grizzly bears, we can understand their survival. Uh, this is especially important for females. And we can also understand their range, you know, how they, how they move across a landscape, what resources they use. And one of the things we've learned about grizzly bears in the greater Yellowstone area is they're great travelers. And so if we capture a bear uh, here in Idaho, it can move into Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming to den. And when it emerges from its den in the spring, it can move down into the southern part uh, of the ecosystem into Wyoming, or it can move north into Montana, can cycle back into Idaho. And so, you know, having a large landscape to roam is an important part of having grizzly bears. And the way we catch grizzly bear is uh, we set up traps on national forest lands. And uh, we go out and collect roadkill over the course of the summer. We keep the roadkill, usually elk or deer. Uh, we pick those up off the highway and, and use those as bait. We set them up on remote parts of the forest and we, we close those areas off to human entry with, with signs. And a uh, bear goes in, pulls that bait, the trap shuts. And then we go in and uh, we stick a long needle through the, very carefully stick a long needle through the, through the grate and jab the bear with a drug that uh, puts it to sleep and also anesthetizes it so it doesn't, it's not really aware of what's going on. We, we take it out of the trap and put it in the shade and immediately, you know, just like a, if you were a patient on an operating table, we give it oxygen, we monitor its vital rates to make sure it's in good shape as we're putting the radio collar on it. And uh, we also collect other information on its, its fitness and condition. Uh, we collect DNA so that we know, you know, who this bear is and maybe a little bit about how it relates to the population. And, and then when we're finished, we lift them up, put them back in the trap, close the trap, and then uh, we let him sit there for, for you know, most of the rest of the day to recover from the drug so he's fully lucid before we release him. And then we have a long, long rope attached to that trap door uh, and also several pulleys and we release him from the safety of the vehicle. And, and in general, they, they get out of the trap or fine and move on their way. And these traps can stay on the bears for a couple of years and it gives us great data to support, you know, population monitoring as well as management, understanding, you know, where those key areas are what, that they need for habitat and also that areas where we may want to manage, you know, uh, the special, you know, you, know, you do special outreach to people that this is a grizzly concentration area to avoid conflict. So that's a big part uh, of management is capturing and collaring bears. And then another part, as I've alluded hey, Rob, to, um, I'm going to just pop in for one second because we have a bear-related question. All right, um, lay it on me. <laughs> this question's from Lee, and um, he has uh, two bear-related questions. One is, how much bigger is a grizzly bear than a black bear, which is a type of bear we have in Florida? And what are the other differences between a grizzly bear and a black bear? Okay. Well, a grizzly bear, you know, the largest grizzly bears uh, can be quite a bit larger than uh, the largest brown bears. Grizzly bears are interior bears of the Yellowstone. And our bears, uh, you know, a big bear for us would be 500, maybe 600 pounds. And uh, b black bears in some areas can get that big, but that's, that's pretty big. And normally they don't. Uh, bears and brown bears in Alaska can get over 1,200 pounds, uh, 11, 1,200 pounds. So that, those are very large. And so in, in general, grizzly bears are larger than black bears, although you can have some large black bears out there. The other, 
uh, differences are in, in appearance. Grizzly bears have a different profile. They have a dished face as, as opposed to, you know, sort of a sloping nose of the black bear. There's a prominent hump that you can see on grizzly bears. Um, you can see it in this um, sedated bear here. Is that, that hump is basically shoulder muscle. That's where shoulder muscles come together and it creates a big hump. And uh, you can see it a little bit in this picture, but not as much. And then finally, the, the claws. Grizzly bears have you know, long raking claws that are mounted more on the top of their feet. And, uh, and black bears have shorter claws. But probably the most important uh, difference between grizzlies and black, black bears is the disposition. Grizz black bears, while very capable of, of harming humans, and they do uh, periodically harm humans, their temperament is more retiring and, and modest, whereas grizzly bears, uh, while not looking for trouble, are, are not afraid of trouble. They're, they have a, a very, uh, very touchy and have a temper and are very protective of their cubs and protective of uh, food resources. They don't like surprises on the trail. And so grizzly bears in general are, are a much more dangerous bear. Thank you so much. That's, I'm sure Lee is very excited for that answer because that was, I think, exactly what he was looking for. Um, I just want to remind everyone that if they have other questions, to text them to 813-501-2204. So, Rob, you were talking about uh, other ways that you guys um, ensure uh, conservation of bears, so I'll let you carry on. Thank you. So since the population has recovered in the Great Yellowstone area, you know, we're, we're monitoring that population and we're trying to avoid conflicts with people. That is what is most dangerous to bears because in conflicts with people, uh, they often get into trouble, sometimes lethal trouble. It's also not very good for people because uh, they can have property damage to their homes, they can lose livestock or be injured or worse. And so a big part of our efforts is gonna be avoiding conflicts. And those efforts are all about communicating to the public. And so going into communities and reminding them that they're recreating when they go on the national forest lands or in grizzly bear habitat, and they need to you know, be aware of that, be careful, uh, travel in larger groups, uh, make noise, stay together. Uh, one thing we encourage is carrying bear, spray, bear pepper spray it can be a great deterrent if you do have a bear encounter. And so getting that word out to hunters, hikers, all recreationists, uh, educating campers that when they're in bear country, they need to keep a super clean camp. You know, bears are for our food foraging machines. And so if they have an opportunity to pill for some human food, they will. And when they do that, it, they become very difficult to manage and it's very, uh, very hard to convince them not to uh, pill for more. Um, the same uh, threat is true in uh, subdivisions or cabins that are adjacent to grizzly bear habitat. You know, storing your food and behaving a certain way. You know, when you're when you have a house in grizzly bear country, you're you're you know you have to do things a little bit differently. You have to maybe keep your garbage uh, under lock and key in your garage. You very, it can be dangerous to feed birds or hummingbirds or other birds. And you want to keep your barbecue in. You don't want anything that can attract bears. And so communicating to folks about this, continually reminding them, giving them resources, education resources to help them be safe and avoid conflicts. That's going to be about what, that's a big part of what, you know, grizzly conservation and management is going to be in the greater Yellowstone moving forward. So with that, with that, I'll move on to the next project, which is uh, our Trumpeter Swan Restoration Project in Teton Valley, Idaho, which is a part of the Greater Yellowstone. And again, I'll start off with a little historic perspective on trumpeter swans. Uh, trumpeter swans used to be, you know, widely occurring throughout North America. And prior to the onset of modern wildlife management in the early 20th century, um, you, you know, one of the things that happened was market hunting. Uh, so people would go out and shoot animals for commercial purposes, and there wasn't a lot of tracking of that. And, and that unregulated uh, activity resulted in a lot of declines of a lot of species, and one of them was trumpeter swans. And trumpeter swans were killed for their skins and the feathers, and the feathers went in mostly to the hat trade, 
which was popular in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So this is something we have in common with Florida. The feather trade, uh, illegal feather trade was a huge problem in Florida and also uh, precipitated action, you know, a lot of legal action that changed things. You know, this was, uh, the feather trade had a lot to do with the onset of uh, conservation and laws uh, that resulted in the modern system of wildlife management we have today. So we no longer have the feather trade, but uh, as the result of the feather trade, uh, by the early 20th centuries, trumpeter swans were thought to be extinct, completely gone. And uh, until they were discovered uh, by some early explorers in the greater Yellowstone area, there was a small population hanging on. And it turned out later that we found out there was another population up in Alaska, but it was good news. And, and with finding this species thought to be extinct, there was a lot of uh, conservation activity and a lot of efforts to protect these birds and recover them, including establishment of one of the early national wildlife refuges outside of Yellowstone National Park. And so as a result of those uh, finding the birds and then in implementing conservation, they've recovered really well throughout North America. There's good populations in the Pacific Coast and the Midwest. In the Rocky Mountain population of which we're part, there's about 6,000 birds, but the Ironically, the Yellowstone breeding population is still struggling. And so one of the things we're trying to do is expand and improve the viability of, of breeding birds in the greater Yellowstone area. The current threats uh, for trumpeter swans, the biggest one, and this is true for a lot of wildlife, is loss of habitat. And, uh, you, know, you know, trumpeter swans are a large bird. They're the largest uh, waterfowl in North America. They can be up to 20 pounds. And they need secure habitat away from disturbance. And, you know, we as humans love water, uh, just like swans. And, and so losing, you know, secure wetland habitat or riverine habitat is the, probably the biggest threat uh, to these birds. Another threat um, is power line collisions. For whatever reason, these birds are very susceptible, particularly in winter, to collisions with power lines. And uh, we're actively working with power companies to try to mark lines, particularly when, when they're near water, to try to reduce this threat. And for reducing the threat for loss of habitat, we work with land trusts uh, in our region, like the Nature Conservancy or Teton Regional Land Trust, to, uh, and willing private landowners to put conservation easements on important habitat. And this uh, picture here, this aerial, is uh, air, uh, Teton Valley, Idaho. And most of that landscape is private lands, but has been protected in conservation easements. So this is very valuable wetland habitat for, uh, for trumpeter swans. Another activity we're doing is a translocation project, trying to establish breeding in the Teton Valley, where there's a lot of these conservation easement properties with wetlands. Um, we're working with a facility in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, called the Wyoming Wetland Society. And they raise uh, captive reared trumpeter swans for wild restoration, you know, birds that can go and help repopulate some of these wetland areas. And basically, they, they raise these young swans, they're called cygnets, with, with families. And when they get to be about 70 days old, um, this, this uh, image of the biologist holding the trumpeter swan in the middle picture, that's a 70 day old cygnet. You can see he's a young one because he's a little grayer. In the, the adult in the upper right. And so we get an adult, a female, she's the foster mom, and she's no longer able to fly. We put her, you know, we build an enclosure around this wetland to keep the swans in and predators out. We put the mom in there, uh, give her about a week to get, a, get established in this uh, habitat. And then when she's comfortable and feeding and doing well, we come there with five uh, cygnets, baby swans, and we do a release. And the hope is that uh, the surrogate mom will adopt them and kind of show them the ropes. And generally, that's what we've seen in this slide. You can see the mom and the, and the young cygnets all together. And uh, she actually did, does a pretty good job of keeping track of them and showing them where the good food is. Our ultimate goal is that some of these birds will return and, you know, and bond with this wetland where they've been released and breed. And this is a proven technique around the West. Uh, we've just started this program, so we haven't had breeding success yet, but our goal is in Teton Valley to establish three new breeding territories uh, of trumpeter swans. And so more on that later. And then the final project I wanted to talk to you about was a Wolverine winter recreation study. 
Um, the wolverine is a wilderness animal. It's the it's a largest land uh, dwelling member of the weasel family. They range they range from about 20 to 35 pounds. The females being closer to 20, the males maybe up to 30. And they live up in the in the high mountains. And uh, you know, forage. Uh, they depend heavily on uh, scavenging dead big game in the winter time. So finding a dead elk or a dead deer or a bighorn sheep, whatever they can. And in the summer, they eat a lot of rodents like marmots and pikas that live up in the mountains. And um, a little bit on the historic attributes of uh, wolverine. Uh, you know, talking about both historic and current threats. Um, Wolverine used to occupy the northern uh, part of the United States and in, the, in some of the colder areas. And they, they retracted and were gone from most of the contiguous United States by the 20, early 20th century. And why they retracted is, is a number of factors. It's not perfectly understood, but a, a key aspect of that was probably decline of big game populations. If you remember, they, they scavenge on, depend on scavenging in the winter for animals that have died. And with the European movement west, a lot of, uh, you know, those settlers depend, you know, had a subsistence, dependent on subsistence until they got an agriculture going. That had a big impact on, you know, the herd sizes of, of big game animals and that in influenced wolverine distribution. So they retracted, uh, their, they contracted their population up into Canada. The good news is they sort of uh, have repopulated the lower 48 on their own in the last 50 years. A lot of the northern Rockies habitat has been uh, reoccupied. You know, our, our herds are doing much better now, and so there's, you know, there's really plenty for them to eat. So the current threat uh, that we're most concerned about with wolverines is climate change. And um, the reason is for that is embedded in the wolverines' ecology. Wolverines are, you know, especially the mothers are dependent on snow. They live in high country, and you know, they they breed in the midsummer, but they they have a delayed implantation, so they don't actually uh, the, the young don't start growing inside the mother until uh, in the win in the winter time, usually February or or January. It takes about forty days for them to uh, for their gestation. And in February, the female starts digging a den, and where she digs a den is in the snow. And she likes deep snow, uh, maybe 15 feet deep, and she digs down through the snow and, and gets under a, a log or a, a natural cavity in the rocks and has her kits there. And this snow is important because it protects them from the elements. They're deep down in a protected area. It protects them from predators. When they're born, they're, they're uh, white and uh, pretty helpless and dependent on the mother. And what, what our models predict for climate change is that, you know, these areas with, that have snow in the springtime, because she has her kits for 10 weeks, uh, which takes her into May. So areas that have May snowpack are going to be uh, more and more limited uh, in the next 50 years due to climate change. And so they're going to be isolated areas where, those, where that habitat occurs. And concurrent with all this is, uh, you know, sort of a boom in the western United States in winter recreation. So backcountry snowmobiling and skiing and just exploration is a very uh, important and popular uh, recreational activity in the west. And so there's some concern that there may be a conflict between, you know, wolverines, especially denning mothers, and uh, wildlife recreation. And so to answer some of those uh, questions, you know, are there conflicts that we need to be concerned about? Um, we partnered uh, with uh, the U.S. Forest Service and Round River Conservation Studies, who was actually the, the project principal, to sort of figure out are there potential conflicts between you know, growing outdoor backcountry recreation and, and wolverines. And the way that we did this was we took, you know, we like the grizzly bears, we needed to catch some wolverines and put some collars on them and find out where are these wolverines, what habitat are these wolverines using. So the first step in catching a wolverine is you build yourself a trap in the fall. You go out and you cut up some logs and build a log trap. And then uh, again, you go out and collect roadkill uh, for bait. And then when the winter comes, you bait that trap with, uh, with the meat. 
and a wolverine comes along and he gets captured. We actually have, since it's difficult to get into these traps in the winter, we have a device set up that when the trap closes, we actually get a text and we can, we know that the trap door is closed. We ski in, snowmobile and ski in, uh, sedate the wolverine, uh, put him in a, in a warm place while it's sedated where we can get the collar on him and then move him back into the trap until he's recovered and release him, very similar to the grizzly bear efforts. And what that gives us, after a couple of months, the collar on these animals are designed to just pop off and we can go out and find the collar using telemetry and then download all the data and we can see everywhere this wolverine has been all winter. And so we have a good idea of where their important activities are and we've also found several females dens with this type of activity. And then the other part, a lot easier to catch, are our human subjects. And the way we got data on where recreationists uh, were in the wintertime is we just went to trailheads and popular starting points and asked people to voluntarily wear a GPS device. And overwhelmingly, we had great support among skiers and snowmobilers. You know, most of these folks are out here in this area because they enjoy the open space and wildlife as well as recreation. And so I think they understand the need for balancing, you know, activities. And, and so we got a lot of cooperation. And where we are now is in uh, data analysis. We don't know exactly what's going on with wolverines and recreationists, but we have good data from both the animals and the recreationists. And the goal uh, of this study will be uh, to just provide information to land managers to better balance the needs of wildlife with recreation. So those are my three projects that I thought would give you a flavor uh, of what my job is like. It's probably one, it's probably three of about 10 active projects I have going on right now. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions if folks have them. Thanks, Rob. Um, I actually have a lot of questions lined up here for you. Um, I am just going to flash. Can you, can you coach me as to how to get rid of this uh, PowerPoint? Sure, sure. Just go back up to the um, Hangout screen, the video chat screen, and go ahead and click on either the stop button in the green bar or the the same icon you clicked on to, to sh there you go, we gotcha. Okay. All right, so I've got a lot of questions for you here. Um, I just wanna remind everyone if there are additional questions, you can text your name and your question to 813-501-2204. All right, Rob, the first question I have here for you is from Audrey. And Audrey asks, what inspired you to become a wildlife biologist? Well, um, when I was a kid, I guess I really liked the outdoors. And um, I don't think I really knew much about what a wildlife biologist was when I was a kid, but I, I liked the outdoors. And, and one of the things that, uh, a couple of things specifically that inspired me was one, uh, growing up, my parents uh, had a, a place in the woods on a lake that we all got to go to as you know growing up during the summertime and there was a lot of, no matter where we lived we moved around a lot no matter where we lived we always visited this place and it was uh, just a great outdoor place where we could canoe and fish and, and walk in the woods and and I think that had a lot of bearing on my interests growing up and then another thing was uh, when I was I think 13 years old we got a, a Labrador retriever, a black lab, and she became my best friend. And, and one of the things that she loved to do, and she got me into it, was she loved to roam around the woods and swim in the swamps. And, and uh, so I started, when I was a kid, going out into the woods with her. And, and uh, you know, I think those were the two things that got me really interested in the outdoors and, and specifically in wildlife. And so then as I got older, my, my interest refined more into, you know, wildlife conservation. But, you know, as it, it started early, and those were probably the two things that were very formative. Excellent. Um, I've got another question from a student who says his name is also Rob. And his uh, question is, um, what do you think the most important thing you've learned in your job is, and do you get to learn a lot about the state you live in? Important things, and then do I get to learn a lot about the state I'm in? Yes. The state of Idaho? 
Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I think that the most important thing that I've learned is the importance of communicating with diverse types of people. And I think no matter what career that you have, you're going to find this is important. Um, I have strong interests in, in, in my job and in, you know, wildlife conservation, but other people, uh, you know, there's maybe some overlap, but they have other interests. They're interested in, in taking care of their families. They're interested in keeping their job and, and they can't always be thinking of, of wildlife conservation. And so, being able to interact with those people respectfully, understanding that they come from maybe different perspectives, but you know, and and but still may be interested in what I'm saying. Looking for common ground, those are those are very important uh, things that I've learned. Is that the ability to communicate with different types of people has a lot to do with whether you're going to be successful or not. And as for the second question, does it provide an opportunity to learn about the state? And the answer is, you bet. It's uh, it's been a great way to learn about the state, both, you know, the important, you know, you know, human aspects of the state, you know, how people make money and what are important to people, but then where are important wildlife populations and what are the issues and threats facing wildlife. So it's been a great way to learn about the state of Idaho. Excellent. Um, so I've gotten a question that a lot of students have asked, so I'll just uh, mention who the question is from. We, uh, Aubrey, uh, Audrey asked it, as well as Sam, and also um, Stacy asked, um, what is it, we, we saw a lot about your projects, but what would you say it is that you do on a day-to-day -day basis? What are your daily tasks in a typical day? Well, uh, I would say in my current position, I, I spend about 35 to 40 percent of my time, if I'm lucky, <laughs> in the field. So going out and, uh, you know, trying to monitor wildlife populations, maybe trying to collect information, maybe trying to implement habitat improvements, trying to, you know, uh, do, do projects that um, improve wildlife habitat. And then the rest of the time I'm in the office, you know, part of our job is customer service, a big part of our job. You know, we, we work for the people of Idaho. And so they have a lot of questions about wildlife. Uh, that can be hunters and fishermen and hunters and anglers looking for good spots to hunt and fish. And we're happy to talk to them. It could be, you know, hikers who have questions about grizzly bear safety. It could be a homeowner that has, a problem with a woodpecker tapping on his house, all, all kinds of questions related to wildlife. And, and sometimes they're just, you know, inquisitive and want to know. Sometimes there's an issue. So a big part of our job is customer service. And then also report writing. Uh, you don't go out in the field and collect data or collect monitoring information without having to come back and, and generate some reports so that, you know, that information is, is secure for the future. And, uh, you know, a lot of meetings, meeting with partners like the Forest Service or the BLM and private conservation groups to try to strategize on working together on, on projects. All of those projects that I described uh, are partnership endeavors. We haven't, uh, pursue, we pursue very little alone, in, in particularly in my job, so working a lot with partners. So I think that, uh, that, about, that about sums it up. Okay. Um, I have a question that's actually been asked by two students. One student didn't give their name, but the other student's name is Ariel. And they asked the question, um, as, as one could imagine, there are risks and danger, dangers associated with your job. Have you ever had any scary experiences or dangerous situations with an animal you were handling? Um. Ha handling an animal is always potentially dangerous uh, to the animal and to the biologist. And so we have a high level of training and, and care when we handle an animal. And uh, so while that is potentially dangerous, um, uh, I haven't personally been injured. Uh, some of the animals, we, we catch deer and elk, uh, bighorn sheep, mountain goats, grizzly bears, and there, there have been injuries. Uh, in some of those captures, but none to me personally, but you're right, that is potentially dangerous. I would say I was actually injured by an animal uh, several years ago 
uh, not while handling it. I was retrieving a mountain goat collar in the mountains, and you know the collar had dropped off. And to get the data, we needed to find that collar and download it. And um, I found the collar, and the goat was right above me, and knocked a rock down on my head, and, uh, bonked me on the head, and uh, cut my head open. And so I had to get, I had to hike out and get stitches, but luckily it wasn't serious. Um, probably the biggest threats, uh, in my opinion, are less about the animals and more about the the terrain. You know, being in remote locations, uh, hypothermia, um, and just you know, be, taking care to be prepared to be in remote situations. And so we we have a lot of training on handling animals. You know, negotiating uh, difficult terrain in remote situations and and survival skills. And so. Um, so, so far, so good, and, uh, but it is, you know, it is a potentially, it does have some potential dangers. Very good. Um, Albert asks, uh, wants to know, what do you find most interesting about your career? I'm sorry, most what? Interesting about your career. Um, there's a lot of interesting things about it. Probably the most interesting is looking for solutions. And I, I, I would expect that this is going to be the case with a lot of different, you know, people that you talk about in different careers. And the problems uh, in wildlife conservation and management are, are complex. And, you know, un understanding the problem, understanding a species needs, understanding the human aspects of the of a problem and then deriving a solution is the most interesting and challenging part i would say very good um we have a question from luna and luna asks um what is do you think is the greatest impact that your job makes on the community and how well um I think the important impacts, uh, I think there's a number of important impacts that we strive for. And one is, you know, economic. Uh, you know, wildlife conservation and wildlife-based re wildlife recreation is a billion-dollar industry in, in Idaho. So it's an important aspect of our economy. And it's an aspect of our economy that's sustainable and supports I think healthy human uh, environment as well. And so when you have healthy fisheries, you have healthy, you have clean water and abundant water. And when you have healthy wildlife populations, you are more likely to have clean air and, and good habitat. And so, you know, when you, when you have healthy wildlife populations, you have a good recreation, uh, chunk of your recreation economy and that supports sustainability. So I think that's important and it gives me some satisfaction. But really, you know, if you look at the economies that are out there in the world, wildlife is probably never going to compete with them. And so one of the most in, important aspects is just the inherent, you know, protecting the inherent value of wildlife for future generations. Uh, wildlife uh, are a great source of uh, adventure. And I think as the world uh, gets more populous and we become more gadget oriented and urban, that adventure becomes further and further away from us. And I think when, by protecting, um, you know, these wildlife and, and the habitat that depend on, we're protecting a, a legacy of adventure, adventure for future generations. Whether you're like climbing a mountain to try to see a nesting golden eagle or, you know, going into a remote watershed to try to catch a Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Those are you know, rare and valuable experiences that I think are need to be protected. And so that's an important and satisfying part of my job is, is stewarding those resources for, for the public and for their enjoyment. Very good. Uh, Lee has another question for us, and his question is, does the trumpeter swan migrate? And if not, how do they deal with the winter temperatures? Well, uh, the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, most of the trumpeter swans in the Rocky Mountain population, about 90% of them, um, breed up in Canada, in Alberta. And um, come fall, they actually migrate down to the greater Yellowstone area, most of them. And so 
they winter in a very cold area too, um, but they need open water and and they are very uh, very well equipped to deal with um, cold habit, uh, cold weather. They have very dense uh, plumage that can keep them warm, and you know the the problem that they have with cold weather is uh, if things freeze up and they're unable to get food. So if the rivers all freeze and the, you know the lakes will do and will freeze in the winter, and they can't access food, then they'll starve. But they don't, you know, they don't in general have a problem with the cold. Um, and then there's a population here in in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, and the Greater Yellowstone area that is non-migratory, or at least doesn't migrate long distances. So they breed and winter in the same areas roughly. And so you'll you'll find that with a lot of populations um, of animals, some migrate long distances, some medium distances, and st some are resident. And that's the case with uh, trumpeter swans. So they do well in the cold, and some migrate, some don't. Another animal-related question for you. Um, this is from Eileen, and the question is, are wolverines dangerous to people? No. Uh, wolverines are d generally don't pose a a danger to people or their livestock or, or their livestock or, or animals. They, they're very, uh, try to avoid people and are retiring. Uh, if you, you know, tried to catch a wolverine and, and handle them like we do sometimes, <laughs> you have to be very careful. You've created that situation where any animal is going to defend itself. But for a person out on the landscape, hiking or skiing, they're, they're not, they pose no threat. Excellent. Um, another one here that's animal related is how long does it take to find and tag an animal? And that question's from Heather. Well, it depends on the animal. Um, and it depends on how you, when you start measuring time. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the biggest efforts we have uh, for capturing animals in Idaho is capturing deer and elk for, for management. Um, you know, and we're able to catch those relatively quickly compared to other species, but that's because biologists, big game biologists, have spent a lot of time understanding and, and discovering where those animals winter so that they can be easily captured. And so it's taken years for them to <clears throat> perfect their, their skills and understand where the animals are winter, but now that they they have that understanding, they can go in and readily uh, capture those. And they're usually captured from helicopters with a net gun or drop nets. And then, you know, people go in and subdue them and collar them and release them without drugs. And they're, they're, that group of our fishing game is, is a very skilled uh, group and can do it very quickly. But that's because they've been working on it a long time. For a rare species like a wolverine or um, say, uh, you know, we have a rare bird here, a yellow-billed cuckoo, it can be very difficult and take very a lot of effort and a lot of time to capture them because they're much more rare and because the techniques are less well-established as they are for, for big game. So it varies quite a bit. Okay. Um, this question is in relation to um, animals as well, and this is from Alexis, and she asks, when you encounter animals that are injured, do you ever rehabilitate them? And if not, is there a center you would send them to? Uh, well, uh, the answer is yes. Um, we have uh, we don't rehabilitate animals ourselves at Fishing Game. Um, that would be very time consuming. Animals get injured a lot on the landscape, whether it's deer getting hit by a car or, or deer or birds crashing into a, a window. And uh, we do have rehabilitation facilities uh, that wildlife rehabilitation facilities that we partner with in Idaho that help us with animals that can be rehabbed and released. And probably one of our uh, biggest uh, partners here in the Upper Snake region is the Teton Raptor Center. And so if we get an injured raptor, uh, they're a licensed, federally licensed facility and very skilled and have vets and, you know, very high quality facilities. And we've been able to bring raptors in there and, and have them uh, rehabilitated and released. And so that's uh, one example of a group that we like to work with. We've also had good luck with the Snowden Wildlife Preserve uh, down by McCall, Idaho. 
uh, every now and then we run into a orphaned black bear cub and and uh, we've had good luck you know, shipping those guys down there and and they'll take care of them and able to release those back into the wild and so uh, yes we do uh, we we do get involved in rehabilitation through partnership um, although we have limited ability to do that Speaking of bears, uh, this person asks, if you came across a bear in the woods, do you react differently whether it's a black bear versus a grizzly bear? Yes. Um, you know, the, the, the first thing is, uh, you know, when you go into bear country, the best thing to do is to, uh, is to plan for an encounter. So you should go in expecting to encounter bears, even if you don't. So it's like anything, being prepared, and, and you need to carry your bear spray and ideally be with a, with a group, at least a couple of you, and, and just be alert. You know, this, the woods in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem are not a good place for daydreaming as you're taking a hike. You want to be really paying attention. <laughs> and so when you, when you encounter a bear, um, you know, you, I, whether it's a black bear or a, a grizzly bear, you need to proceed with caution. Black bears, even though they're not as temperamental as grizzly bears, can certainly uh, harm humans and in rare cases they do. And so you need to treat all bear encounters seriously, but you need to especially treat a grizzly bear encounter uh, seriously. And you need to um, uh, stop immediately and and you know, there's a wide range of, of situations for grizzly bear encounters, and it's difficult to cover them all. But um, you need to be prepared to encounter a grizzly bear and take that encounter much more seriously. Okay. Um, Alexis asks another question. Um, she wants to know what is your favorite species and why. Hmm. Um, I have a number of favorite species. Um, you know, all, I like all the wildlife that we run into in Idaho, including the, the big game. I enjoy having them out on the landscape and, and raptors. But I, I tend to be really uh, interested in, and, uh, and passionate about rare species. I think part of what makes our area exciting is the amount of, you know, sort of rare wildlife that we have out there, the number of different species. And so encountering something that's not often seen or working on something that's that's threatened is uh you know species like we've talked about today like a wolverine and i've only ever seen even though i i work uh in the you know in the wilds uh, you know somewhat frequently i've only seen two wolverines actually you know not you know not in a trap just out there running wild and so that's an amazing animal um uh, i really like um there's a water bird species called long-billed curlew, which is kind of a crazy looking bird that we have uh, walking around out. And they, they live out with, they really uh, like ranches and ranching activities. And they, so they live in the valleys and they're, you know, they're large and they nest on the ground and they're just a cool species. And, and they, you know, that's, that's an animal for which there's some conservation challenges. I like them. I like birds in general, uh, grizzly bears, uh, you know, some of those, uh, just a variety really, but they tend to be more uh, the, the special status species that get me excited. I've got three more questions for you. Okay. Uh, and then we will wrap up. So the, um, the first of the three is, do bears ever get snagged on trees with the collars that they're, they're tagged with? That's a very good question, and the answer is uh, animals with collars sometimes can get hooked up on fences or trees, and so when a bear bear collars are put on, so that they're designed to come off. Uh, bears, uh, especially males, fight a lot. Uh, they're big fighters with each other, and so uh, we don't want that collar to be a source of injury or mortality. And so we, we're very careful to put them on at just the right. Uh, tightness so that they they stay on in normal condition conditions but if they get hung up they come right off and we've had good luck with that and it, it's sort of like how you would put a dog collar on so there is a there is a danger that and we we paid uh, we have pay special attention to make sure that they can come off if they get in a pinch
Very good. Was there a um, second part of that question, or is that it? Nope, that was it. Uh, there's there's um, two. I've two questions from Ariel. So um, so I guess my three three questions was a, a little bit of a fib because she's got two questions. So um, this her questions are: as a wildlife bio biologist, does your job take you to many different types of environments or terrain? And do you have a set team that you work with? Um, in your job, oh, actually three questions, and how long have you worked in this particular position? So how long have you worked? Do you have a set team that you work with and do you get to go to lots of different terrain? Okay, I'm, uh, I've worked for in my current job for seven and a half years and we are absolutely a team uh, at multiple scales. The whole Department of Fishing Game is a team and then each region is a team. So in the Upper Snake region, um, I don't know how many employees we have, probably maybe 50. And we're a team that works together. If, if someone needs help, uh, you can ask and you can usually readily get help. Uh, my, t my team within the region is the wildlife team. And so we have a regional wildlife manager and then uh, four biologists that work for him. And we're the wildlife section. And, and so if they need help, you know, a lot of them work on big game issues. If they need help on big game, then I, I can help them. Uh, if they need it, and if I need help with uh, some of my rare species um, endeavors, that they they're willing to help me too. And we also have a, a biologist in our wildlife section whose job is to deal with uh, wildlife conflicts. So you know, in an area where agriculture is so important, you know, sometimes elk, if they go into a rancher's uh, stack yard and and uh, start eating the hay for his cows, then we have to you know try to fix that situation and so he's busy all winter and we try to help him as well so the uh, second part of that question is absolutely i'm part of multiple teams and that's a very important part of our success and the third part of that question i forget was uh, do you get to go to lots of different uh terrains and environments yes and uh that's a great part of my job and and um so i don't get to go to subtropical forest or mangrove swamps in florida because i'm in idaho but I do get to go to alpine tundra up in the high mountains and then into the mountain forests and then down on the rivers, down in the sagebrush. And also we have, you know, some big wetland complexes that are amazing down here in, in uh, the upper snake region of Idaho. So I get to work in, in all the different types of habitat uh, that we have. And that can range from about 5,000 feet in elevation to 12,000 feet in elevation. Excellent. Lots of different different uh, places to go, things to see. Yep. Um, this question is, what preparation did you do to be effective in your job? Well, uh, you know, that starts off with your, your schooling. You know, you have to be a wildlife biologist, uh, like a lot of professions, you have to go to uh, school and study a lot of the either wildlife management or wildlife conservation or some sort of natural resource. Uh, increasingly, um, you have to pursue graduate level work after that. Um, and then um, a lot of people start off their careers doing as a wildlife technician, doing a lot of the field work, um, doing almost all field work for years, and uh, and then developing you know communication and writing skills. So that your your skill set is beyond the field. Uh, that's how you advance. So you can go out and collect data, but then you know generate you know products of value uh, either by communicating them in writing or or verbally. Those are very important skills. Uh, we're we're always training uh, to further develop those skills. Uh, whether it's um, you know understanding computer programs that we use being a better public speaker, um, being a better uh, manager of people, and then technical still skills, how to, you know, navigate in the, in the field, uh, and, you know, protocols for counting and catching animals. And so uh, those, that's probably a, a summary of the type of training that we need to be successful. And it's interesting because a lot of those skills are really applicable to so many jobs, the communication piece and the, um, you know, good quality writing and, and all of those. So uh, 
it's, it, we've heard that consistently a lot to uh, through a lot, a lot of the presentations we've heard during this week. So those are definitely important skills in addition to all your super amazing animal uh, tracking skills, which are very specialized. <laughs> um, yeah, those are specialized, but I think you'll find out in, the, in our outfit and other outfits that the people who tend to be in charge are those who are, are good, effective communicators. So the last question from our audience today is from Luna, and her question is, what is your favorite book? Hmm. My favorite book. Um, I'm an avid reader, and so I have a lot of favorite books. And um, one that jumps to mind, although uh, one that jumps to mind oops, sorry about that, is The Snow Leopard by Peter Matheson. And it's a story of uh, a man's journey into the Himalayas, and he's actually traveling with a biologist. And he's trying to overcome some problems he has in his life. And uh, he has some great adventures in the Himalayas. And I would recommend that uh, great uh, as a great book to read, Peter Matheson. One, one of my favorite authors, too. Very good. I'll, I'm going to add that to my reading list. It sounds like mm -hmm. a good one. So thanks, Luna, for that question. Um, so I'll end with a, a comment, actually, from one of our audience members uh, who didn't ask a question because they said uh, they wanted to let you know that they thought you were extremely interesting and prepared and wanted to thank you for being here. So I will uh, echo the, that sentiment. Uh, we really appreciate you. Um, oh my goodness, I have to ask you this question because I know that this is something. We've got one more eleventh hour question, and I uh, and I have to ask it ask it to you. Um, so this is from Alexis again, and she says she would love to participate in falconry after she graduated. Mm -hmm. um, is hunting with raptors ever allowed in Yellowstone National Park? No, there's no, uh, in general, there's not hunting in, Yellow, in uh, Yellowstone or in any national park. Um, falconry is something you could pursue outside of the parks. And um, we have falconers that are, are registered in, in Idaho and who, um, you know, have a variety of different birds and different hunting styles. And so, but no, yeah, no hunting in Yellowstone. You'd have to uh, hunt in national forest lands or some of those low sage, sage lands, or if you get permission on private lands, then you could pursue falconry that way. Excellent. Thank you. Well, now I really mean it. That was the last question. And okay. um, <laughs> thank you so much for being with us today. We really, really appreciate it. I think, I know I learned a ton of information and I'm sure that our viewers out there um, learned a ton of information too. Um, and uh, you know, I'm getting some texts now from our students just saying thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And I, I think we all really feel that way. So thanks again so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It was great fun and I appreciate the good questions and wish you all the best in uh, your future careers. Thanks so much.